You're listening to the Nurse Child Podcast, episode number 57. Welcome to the Nourish Child Podcast, a show about childhood nutrition, feeding kids, and dealing with the ups and downs of growing a healthy child. Here's your host, registered dietitian and childhood nutrition expert, Jill Castle. What can you do when your preschooler won't eat breakfast? Is taking control of sweets and saying no being too restrictive? How can you help the picky athlete who can't seem to get full and satisfied? I'm answering these questions and more today on the Nourish Child Podcast. This episode of the Nourish Child Podcast is brought to you by the Nourish Child Project, a program for parents. Do you feel like you somehow missed out on the basic nutrition education you need to successfully nourish your child? I bet you did. Many parents strive to nourish their child well, but find themselves faced with challenges and questions. In the Nourish Child Project, you will get my blueprint for nourishing healthy kids inside and out. Here's actually what you'll get. A food system that includes a balance of all foods, not a restrictive meal plan or diet. A feeding strategy that is proven to be effective and nurturing to children, as well as ways to build healthy habits for now and into the future. Get the Nourish Child Project today by going to www.jillcastle.com forward slash programs. Hello, welcome to the Nourish Child Podcast. I'm Jill Castle, your host, and you've tuned in to a show about childhood nutrition, feeding kids, and dealing with the inevitable ups and downs of raising healthy ones inside and out. If this is your first time here, I am so honored that you came to check out this show. And if you're a returning listener, welcome back. I'm a pediatric dietitian nutritionist, and I own my own company called, wait for it, Jill Castle Nutrition. I know, so creative, right? (laughs) I work with families in my private practice, companies and organizations as a consultant and an advisor, and I travel the country and sometimes the world speaking about childhood nutrition in my keynotes and workshops. Not to mention, I spend quite a bit of time blogging, podcasting, and creating a variety of programs and resources so you can raise a nourished child. Today on the show, I'm answering your questions. I get a few questions and comments each week from readers of my blog, The Nourished Child, and listeners of this podcast. So today, I thought it would be fun to answer a few of them. Before I get started, though, I have two important announcements. Number one, I got a facelift. (laughs) Not a real facelift, although I am getting older. I actually have a new website, and I hope you'd like to check it out. I revamped and revised and upgraded my website, streamlined a lot of things on the website, and I'm just right now super obsessed with it and love it to death. So I hope that uh, you might want to go and check it out. You can find it at www.jillcastle.com. Number two, the Nourish Child Project is starting very soon. It's an online program for parents plus live coaching calls with me. The goal is, in 30 days, you will be able to transform your food system, feeding strategy, and get on top of the healthy habits your child needs to grow well now and into the future. The Nourish Child Project will start the third week of May. Here's how it goes. I will announce the opening of registration on my newsletter which if you're not a member of the newsletter yet, you can go to www.jillcastle.com. And right there on the front home page, there's an option to sign up for the newsletter. And I actually have a great little new, brand new guide called How to Nourish a Healthy Child. And it's a checklist and you can get that as a little bonus for signing up for the newsletter. But I'll announce the opening of the Nourish Child Project program on my newsletter in early May. 
Uh, you'll have just a little short window of time to sign up for it because it is a live program, which means that in addition to getting the online program, which is a five-module program with lessons and lots of checklists and downloads and templates for you to use to make it easier to feed your child and to really get this food system in place, you'll get that. But you'll also have an opportunity to meet with me every single week for a couple of hours to work through some of your questions and challenges and strategies. So I'm bringing a live component to the Nourish Child Project so that you can feel connected not only with me and get personalized feedback, but also be connected with other parents in the program. So if you are interested in learning more about it, jump onto my newsletter or go ahead and just send me an email letting me know you're interested and I'll get you wrapped in on the info. I'll also include a link to the program in the show notes. So let's get on to the show. I wanted to pick some of the readers and listeners questions I get and give you some things to think about in these very different scenarios, but also not entirely so uncommon. I actually hear similar scenarios that I'm going to showcase today from lots of different parents. So what I want to do, though, is use the framework that I've developed for my own practice, and I've called that the Nourished Path. It's a framework that I train actually other professionals to do during the workshops that I offer, and I've been using this method for years. I believe it's an approach that is effective in addressing the needs of the whole child, not just food or just talking about feeding or just addressing development, but incorporating all three to be highly effective in addressing the most pertinent needs of the child, but also being very global and integrative when talking about childhood nutrition with kids. So I cover this whole approach, this trifecta of childhood nutrition. I cover it in my TEDx talk, and I'll include the link in the show notes so you can see how it can be used with your own child. And if you're a professional listening to this, see how it can be used when you're working with families and children who have different challenges around nutrition. Okay, so the first scenario I am calling, quote unquote, won't eat breakfast. So here's the question. Dear Jill, my almost four-year-old son has always been a somewhat slow eater and never one who wants to get up in the morning and eat. The past month or so, he has not been wanting anything for breakfast. I've tried so many options with him, getting some of his favorites, smoothies, baking muffins together, etc. I think part of the problem is mornings are somewhat rushed and he's up early so he doesn't have the typical wait time he would on weekends where he can wake up and play a bit before eating. We send over breakfast with him to daycare to eat before school and have tried waking him a little earlier to eat something at home. Nothing seems to be working lately. I'm just very worried about his lack of eating first thing in the morning. Any tips or advice would be greatly appreciated. Thank you, Jill. Noran. So when we use this template or this nourished path approach, I break things down into three categories. Number one, I want to know about food and nutrients because let's face it, kids need good nutritious food and they need to be meeting their nutrients for growth and development or they won't be healthy. So I always check food and nutrients. Number two, I also check feeding. So the strategies that are being used, and I want parents to use positive feeding strategies. So I always screen and sort of triage around the feeding aspect. And then number three, I always look at development. So where is that child in their growth and development, both physically, cognitively, emotionally, and socially? So I use this sort of filtered, nourished path approach, food and nutrients, feeding strategies, and development. So I want to take you through that related to this particular case or question about this little four-year-old guy who's a slow eater, doesn't want to get up in the morning and eat, and the mom has tried all kinds of tactics to help her son eat before he heads out to preschool or daycare. And she's looking for some more advice. So let's break this down. So number one, 
in regards to food and nutrients, my first question almost always is, is this child growing well? And if you've listened to this podcast before, you know that we can tell if a child's growing well by looking at their growth chart and really looking at what's going on over time. So remember, weight and height growth should be progressively tracking within a specific channel on the growth chart. And we want to see that tracking happen in that same channel year after year after year. If we see deviations, weight gain, you'll see bumping up or jumping up on the growth chart, crossing over channels in an upward direction. If we see weight loss or lack of weight gain, we see flatlining and or dropping channels on the growth curve. So in this case, I would want to know if this child is gaining weight and growing well. If he is, you have less to worry about. You have less to be afraid about. So I just want to put that out there first. He seems to be eating well the rest of the day. And what we know about children is that they are really good at upregulating their eating when they have skipped a meal or a snack. So if you're not, as the parent, interfering too much with forcing or nagging your child to eat more food, or restricting their access to food, if you're not interfering too much with their regulation of their appetite and you're just, you know, using your structure of feeding, your schedule of offering foods at regular times throughout the day, then your child should be able to regulate their eating whenever they've skipped a meal or a snack. They should upregulate or downregulate even if they've eaten a lot during the day. And so that's sort of that natural appetite regulation that we want to create a framework around our meals and snacks so that kids can naturally upregulate or downregulate their eating. I suspect he's matching his needs if he is growing well. However, we want to check the food groups. So is there or are there any missing foods or food groups this child is missing out on on a regular basis? For example, if he's not drinking dairy products or eating dairy products, I would want to know that I would address that either by outlining strategies to include more of those foods in his regular diet or addressing that with a multivitamin and mineral supplement if we need to. We also want to make sure that snacks are nutritious and strategic. So when I say strategic, I mean I like moms and dads to monitor what their children are eating so they have a really good idea of what has been consumed during the day and what has been missed. So if a child is not eating breakfast, as in the case of this little guy, we want to make sure that snacks are nutritious and built to make up for the losses of not eating breakfast. So like I mentioned, we for snack time might need to make up a dairy product, a fruit, a grain, if that mid-morning snack We might need to make that mid-morning snack a little beefier just because we did skip breakfast. So instead of it being a single item light snack, like a piece of fruit, I'd love to see it be maybe a fruit and cheese kebab or a yogurt and fruit and granola mix. So we make up the losses from not eating breakfast. And then last, when it comes to food and nutrients, Always, you know, as you're screening and you're thinking about what your child eats, you want to also be aware of a plan for making up nutrients if you have a child that's picky and just is completely in eliminating a food group or several food groups. So in that scenario, I would consider a supplement. And I think in this particular case scenario, this little guy is making up for his lost meals. But if you have a child who's not making up for lost food groups or missed food groups, you may want to consider using a supplement. And just as a side note, in this age group, vitamin D, omega-3s, calcium, iron are the nutrients that are most commonly missed in this age group. So let's look at feeding. That's our second filter. We want to put our detective caps on and kind of talk about the feeding aspect of what's going on with this little guy or any little guy that could be in the same boat. So we know that 
a lot of pressure to eat or nagging or reminding your child to eat in the morning could backfire. So bringing a lot of attention to the fact that a child isn't eating or isn't eating enough or isn't trying food can be really negative for the child. In fact, we know that it can, in some children, particularly picky eaters, it can actually shut down their appetite, which is a physiological impact. It can cause what we call in the literature and the science early satiety. And as you know, that can backfire and really just shut down a child's appetite, make them eat less, make them be more picky, and even not like the foods you're trying to get them to eat. So my advice would be to make breakfast available on a daily basis without pressure to eat it. Keep that system of, you know, scheduling your meals and snacks and and coming through with them on a regular basis. Keep that system going and ask him to go through the motions of breakfast in the morning. Even if he just sits down for five minutes in front of his breakfast food, having that routine and having food available to him, even if it's just a small cup of dry cereal or a small glass of you know milk or a small container of yogurt, just having the system, the routine of going through the motions of breakfast in the morning can sometimes trigger a child to eat it. You want to make sure you bring variety to the table. So the idea of a bowl of cereal with milk every single day, day after day, can get boring for children. So I love to see families rotate different ideas for breakfast in the morning. So one morning might be waffles, the next morning might be eggs, the next morning might be oatmeal, and the next morning might be cereal, the next morning might be toast. So that variety keeps kids interested, and it also brings a lot of nutrition to the table. Make sure this little guy isn't snacking too much before bedtime. So sometimes, and this happens more often with older kids, teenagers, middle schoolers, they get really hungry and they might snack a lot after dinner. That can actually downgrade their appetite in the morning. So I like to see children who are having a snack, if they are having a snack, that it not be too hefty at night unless we are working on weight gain or something we're working on nutritional rehabilitation in some way, shape, or form. But at night, we don't want too much of a heavy snack. And for preschoolers and toddlers, you know, something light, even just a glass of milk is fine before bedtime. But we want to make sure that the snacking isn't too heavy and impacting the morning appetite. And then last, I would encourage this mom to have a conversation about breakfast and what's happening for breakfast the next morning, and even get her on board to give her little guy a couple of choices and get his buy-in on what he will be eating or what he would like to eat for breakfast the next morning. So she could have a conversation such as, you know, I'm planning breakfast for tomorrow morning. What would you like to have? I've got waffles, or we can do oatmeal. What would you prefer? And giving him two choices and letting him know what's coming down the pike, that we're actually having breakfast in the morning, I'm thinking about it, I'm going to prepare it, I'd like to make it something that you're interested in eating, and giving him two options, or and even having some negotiation around that if those two options don't work and you've got other things on hand, that can be magical in getting children to buy into the whole idea of having breakfast. Okay, that's the feeding component. Now let's talk about development. So development, again, we know that children progress through childhood in a predictable fashion in terms of their development. It's predictable, it's progressive. All kids tend to go through the same stages. They might not go through it at the same time, but the stages are pretty similar for each child. So my questions would be, you know, is he down-regulating his appetite or is he even hungry, truly hungry in the morning? It may be that he's not because he is a preschooler and growth is slowing down overall. And we know that slowed growth impacts appetite. So that would be a question that I would filter through and think about. I'm also sensing he needs more time in the morning to wake up, and I know that perhaps getting him up a little bit earlier has been tried. 
And I think that that is worth a revisit. So is there a way you could get him up a bit earlier to allow him to have a little more time to ease into the morning? And then last, developmentally, you know, four-year-olds love to be involved. And are there ways that you can get him involved in helping prep his breakfast the night before? So maybe he can set the table. Maybe he can put out the dry goods. But just ways to help him get involved in the process for breakfast. I have some resources that I think will help you if you want more ideas around helping that child who is not eating breakfast actually eat breakfast. I have a couple of blog posts. One, the easiest way to serve breakfast to kids. Another one is the importance of breakfast, helping kids start the day right. I have a a free download called 32 Healthy Breakfast Ideas for Kids. You can go to my website and grab that. And last, I interviewed Katie Morford on episode number 19 of the Nourish Child podcast, and our topic was Better Breakfast Recipes for Busy Kids. So I'll include those four resources in the show notes so you can either read more about this topic or listen to another podcast about it. Okay, our second question, our second topic I'm titling, quote unquote, is this restriction? Dear Jill, I don't buy treats myself or only occasionally because I find everyone else does the treating for me. There are just so many opportunities in the community for kids to be treated, clubs, school cake sales, teachers, birthday parties, that I find I have to cut back almost completely at home. The difficulty is when others bring in vast quantities of sweets. My son came home with two boxes of sweets from a secret Santa, yes, in November, which I said I would take off him and let him have a few every day. He is a person who is not a self-regulator, unlike my daughter, but the alternative is that he will just eat all of it if I don't take them away from him. Is this a restrictive practice? I would also do the same for my daughter just to show that I am consistent. Kind regards, Yvonne. Okay, so... If you're a parent, you know managing sweets and treats is not easy. I do find for myself and for the families I work with that a family policy around them is needed and can work really well. I've talked about how to manage sweets on the blog and this podcast before, and I'll include some resources in the show notes so you can read more about it or listen more about it. And I'll highlight when I get through the the filter or the nourish path system in analyzing what we could do for this child. So number one, food and nutrients. You're right, Yvonne, to be watchful and monitor your child's consumption of sweets. When we aren't monitoring this, intake of sweets can get out of control and they can begin to creep into the diet and become way too prevalent. So if you're familiar with my work, you know that I align with the American Heart Association in the aspect of not offering children, young children under the age of two, sweets. So no sweets or very infrequently for that age group. Why? Because they have tiny tummies. And I like to tell parents, there's just really no real estate in the tummy for non-nutrient dense foods. So those sugar foods, they take up real estate. And what that means is they crowd out those nutrient dense foods that really young children should be consuming most of the time. For older children, I like to use the 90-10 rule as a goal to shoot for. So again, the 90-10 rule is 90% of what your child eats on a day-to-day basis is consisting of nutritious foods from those food groups that we talk about all the time. Protein, dairy, grains, fruits, vegetables, healthy fats. 10% is coming from what I call fun foods or sweets and treats. So We want 90% coming from healthy stuff, good nutritious foods, and 10% coming from fun foods. And what that ends up shaking out to be is about one to two fun foods per day. So fun foods are going to be cakes and cookies, candy, soda, sugary beverages, fried foods like French fries or chips. So shooting for one to two fun foods per day is a good place to aim for. Now, I know some of you will not be at that level, 
But again, this is sort of a goal to think about and shoot for. Most importantly, in that 90%, we want to strike a balance of all the food groups and we want to hit an average of that one to two fun foods per day. So I always say, you know, some days when you have treats at home and you have sweets at school and sweets at practice, it can get to be overkill. But that gives you an opportunity to downgrade the fun foods the next couple of days. So you're averaging one to two fun foods per day. This only works if you are monitoring your child's intake, if you are aware, not controlling, not restricting, but aware of how your child eats on a day-to-day basis. Number two, let's look at feeding. Restriction. Restriction is saying no most of the time or not allotting for regular exposure to sweets and treats, or limiting or controlling the amounts of food your child eats or the types of foods you allow your child to eat. So restriction is characterized by those things, but I always like to remind parents also that restriction is in the mind of the child. So (laughs) if your child feels like he's being restricted about certain foods, then he is being restricted. So Again, monitoring allows you to be flexible and set policies around unhealthy foods or foods that are less nutritious for your child. So for example, when sweets come in from the outside environment, this is how we could handle it. You could pick the most favorite types of those sweets that have come into the home, have a few pieces, then put them away for another time, like the weekend or after school. And it sounds like Yvonne has done that. She's collected the sweets that have come into the home, allowed her child to have a few pieces, put them away for another time. I think, you know, when you have a policy in place and your child will know when to expect sweets, when he can have sweets, sort of the way you move around sweets and the rhythm around them within your family, if that's sort of outlined and upfront, children understand it, and it makes it easy as a parent to be able to say no and to explain when your child can expect to see those sweets again. So for example, Yvonne might say, you know, let's have a few now and enjoy them. Let's sit down and enjoy these sweets. You pick out which ones you want. Then I'm going to put them away and we'll have them on the weekend because that's when we have most of our sweets. When my kids were little, You know, I didn't have a lot of sweets in our home, and I didn't serve dessert during the weeknights because I knew that they were getting exposed at sports games and at school for birthday parties and things like that. So I, in my mind, was like, you know, I'm not restricting it at home. It just was always talked about. Like, you guys get stuff outside of the home all the time, so we don't need to have it here. It allowed me to not have to be restrictive and worry about what they were getting in the outside world. I knew they were getting a fair amount, and I knew that we didn't have to showcase them in our home on a regular basis. That being said, I was much more relaxed on the weekends, uh, and we would go out for sweets and treats and have them, and I didn't worry too much about them because I kept a pretty nutritious house during the school week. And I oftentimes explained to my children, you know, you're in school, your brain needs and your body needs really good nutritious food so you can learn and function and, you know, do well in practices and all that good stuff. So they had an understanding that sweets came on the weekend and that sweets were not disallowed, but that we had a policy around them. When you don't have a policy around sweets and treats, it can become extremely tempting to tightly control these foods, become inflexible, and even, yes, be restrictive, excuse me. So when kids feel restricted, they may gravitate to the restricted food even more and worse, lose control of their eating when they have access to them. So this is, you know, giving some thought to your policy around sweets and treats is really a love with limits way of managing your child's food. How you will handle those extra sweets is important to identify and making sure that you are noting how or what ways you can build in 
flexibility around sweets and treats without becoming too lax or indifferent to them or being too restrictive is really the best way to go, I think. Number three, let's look at the developmental aspect of this case scenario. Remember, kids are born liking sweet flavors. So you don't have an outlier if your child is attracted to and enjoys them. I'd say you have a pretty normal kid. That said, though, it's also likely that school-age children will grab the foods their peers are grabbing. They want to be part of the action, not left out. Developmentally, they are known to be sensitive to their peer group. They want to be included and will do just about anything to stay in line with their peers. So that means if everyone is enjoying and indulging in sweets, your child will likely do the same. It's a pretty normal part of development. So for more resources on this topic, I have a blog post called Nine Things Parents Should Know About Sweets for Kids and another one called How Should I Handle My Child's Sugar Cravings. I'll include the links to those two blog posts in the show notes. And then you might want to listen in to episode 29 of the Nourish Child podcast called Food Restriction and Forbidden Food. I'll include that link as well. Some say Supermom is just a figure, but we believe she's real. And that's why we're here on the Crunchy Supermom Show talking about ways to make your vision of your Supermom self a reality, one small step at a time. Hi, I'm Sarah, a nerdy homeschooling mama of three girls, a devoted military spouse, a follower of Jesus, and a no-nonsense, natural-minded Supermom. And I'm Mandy, also a homeschooling mama, but of five little ones a devoted wife to my best friend, also a follower of Jesus, and a dedicated crunchy supermom. Together, we created the Supermom Solution to help busy moms become supermoms. Be sure to visit us online at crunchysupermom.com. Okay, let's talk about our third scenario, our third and final scenario. I'm calling this the picky and heavy athlete. Dear Jill, My daughter is just about 11 years old. She is extremely active. She plays basketball, softball, and is a competitive cheerleader year-round. Even when she's not at practice, she practices and conditions at home, jumps on the trampoline, and never sits still. However, she is heavy. She's an extremely picky eater, and although she wants to eat healthier, she can't find enough choices to keep her full, and with her hectic schedule, she eats on the go a lot, which means drive throughs and unhealthy choices. She's frustrated and I'm frustrated for her. Thanks for your help, Kristen. So let's unpack this scenario a bit. First, let's talk about picky eating. Many people think that picky eaters are underweight, but the truth is far more are normal weight or even carrying extra weight. This is often related to their food choices and their hunger or appetite regulation. In my experience, picky eaters aren't eating vegetables and fruits, which are lower calorie, nutrient dense, filling foods, and they're more likely to gravitate to carbs, crackers, cereals, breads, pasta, even dairy products. None of these foods are bad, but the problem is the overall food balance is off. This child is also an active athlete, so she is burning calories throughout the day. More specifically, she's burning through glycogen, which is the storage form of carbohydrate in the muscle and the liver. The body will desire carbs to replace and restore good glycogen stores for exercise, especially if her body is used to regular exercise. So in other words, athletes get hungry after exercise, and the fastest way to replenish their blood sugar and glycogen is to eat carbs. So in this case, between picky eating and a limited food variety, plus being an athlete who will be driven to seek out carbohydrates, this scenario creates a self-fulfilling cycle. This child exercises, she gets hungry, her body physiologically desires carbs, but she's picky. So she's going to select carbs because they are safe and easy to eat and they satisfy that 
physiological need for carbohydrate. So her diet becomes rich in carbs and the cycle repeats itself over and over. What complicates this scenario even further is the time crunch that participating in a sport causes, which can lead to fast food drive throughs excessive snacking, and poor food choices. So let's start in this scenario. I want to use this nourish path filter I've been talking about, so food and nutrients, feeding, and development. But in this scenario, I want to start with development first. And by the way, you can think about things in any order. You can start with development, you can start with feeding, you can start with food, whatever. But I want you, when you think about these tougher cases, when you're dealing with your child, I want you to think about food, feeding, and development when you think about how you can help your child most effectively. So we're going to start with the development first. And this little girl is 10 and turning 11. This is a time when girls gain a bit of extra weight to prepare for the pubertal growth spurt and the initiation or the start of their period. Carrying a bit of extra belly fat is completely normal at this age. And if you notice girls when they start to grow and get taller, that belly fat redistributes. It actually oftentimes moves north (laughs) and into breast tissue development. So the other thing I want to say is kudos to this young woman for her daily exercise. Every child needs to move their body every day. However, exercise does not cancel out an unhealthy diet. So she is old enough to start to learn about food balance and be supported in trying new foods and branching out in her diet. But mom will want to be careful here, though in the way that she talks about nutrition and food and how she brings new food options into this child's diet. So my book, Try New Food, helps a lot with this process. And another good resource is Extreme Picky Eating by Kaja Rowell and Jenny McLaughlin. Those are two great resources to help with picky eating. When we talk about food and nutrients, it's clear to me that the food balance is off. Her diet is probably too heavy in carbs, and because she eats out a lot, probably too high in fat. I know I'm making a generalized judgment call here because I don't have the details of her diet, but fast food drive throughs are notorious for high-calorie, high-fat foods and foods that are high in salt. So occasional movement through a drive through is fine. On the weekly, regular, it's probably too much. So if this girl is picky about fruits and vegetables, she probably is. If she's a picky eater, I would look into a multivitamin supplement to cover the vitamins and minerals associated with the missing food groups in her diet. And again, I would also strive to use the 90-10 rule if she's consuming too many sweets and treats in her diet. Again, that goal of getting down those fun foods to one to two items per day. And those are in normal portion sizes, not, you know, we're not saying one to two big gulps or giant candy bars. We're talking normal size portions. And then thirdly, feeding. Let's put our feeding detective hat on. All children do well with a structure to feeding, meals and snacks on a regularly timed basis. Especially for an athlete, their food needs to be strategically timed to make sure their bodies get the food it needs to exercise, and to recover well. So regular meals can help also make sure this child's appetite and hunger are covered. And when we cover appetite and hunger well, we can really deter excessive eating and also encourage healthier options. I think a weekly menu and shopping list would help this mom tremendously in staying ahead of meals and snacks and avoiding the safety net of the fast food joint. And I can't say enough about planning ahead meals and snacks, especially if you have a child who participates in sports or who is just busy and active after school in different organizations or groups. One of the Fastest way to tank your child's healthy eating is to get behind on their hunger. When hunger is out of control, children don't make great choices. Their mood changes dramatically. It puts stress on everyone. And so just this simple idea of staying ahead of your child's hunger 
through regular meals and snacks can be incredibly powerful and life-changing. Last, to address her picky eating, I would introduce new foods with a plan. And again, just to back up to the first scenario, I would also make sure this mom is avoiding nagging and pressuring her child to eat and drawing a lot of attention to what she's not eating. I would have a plan with how to introduce new foods and get this little girl's buy-in because she is almost 11 after all. So she can most definitely be part of this. Plan with her which types of food she's willing to try and how you as the parent will go about doing it. Again, use try new food as a resource. I have a a chart, a progressive chart for how to do this. In other words, you want to let her have a say in the matter in terms of what she's willing to try with new foods and how she's going to try them, when she's going to try them, where she's going to try them. And, you know, again, letting her have a say in the matter is partly feeding, but it's also partly developmental stage too. Again, kids are always more receptive to ideas when they can be a part of the decision making. So some important resources for you to know about, nine awesome picky eating resources you need to know about, why you need a healthy snacks list for sports, and two podcast episodes I think you'll find uh, helpful, Feeding Picky Eaters with Dr. Natalie Muth and Healthy Meal Planning Tips with Jessica Levinson. I'll include those links in the show notes as well. So just to recap some of the highlights of this particular episode, using the Nourished Path framework is useful when you're addressing any kind of challenge with your child when it comes to nutrition. So we're not satisfying or dealing with challenges by simply getting more healthy food on board. You need to look at also how you're feeding your child, where they are in their development, even what's going on, or what their natural temperament is, because all of these things matter. Even when I present you with different case scenarios, and these are all three very different case scenarios, I want you to be able to see there are many things to think about as you work through nutrition challenges. It's not just about getting healthy food into your child. I want you to think about the feeding aspect, the developmental stage, and that temperament of your child. I didn't dig into that very much here, but it matters. All of this matters. If you have questions you want answered, feel free to email them to me and I'll try to get them on an upcoming show. If you're a parent who has overcome a challenge and would like to be on the show to share your insight and tips, let me know. I'm Jill Castle, and the purpose of this podcast is to help you nourish your child, no matter his weight, pickiness, or sweet food attraction. And I want you to do it on the inside and on the outside. You can find today's show notes available at jillcastle.com forward slash 057. And now, before you go, could you help me out a little bit? I'd love to see you help the Nourish Child podcast grow. Subscribe to the show on iTunes, Android, Stitcher Radio, Google Play Music, iHeartRadio, Tuned In, and more. I'm not even going to ask you to write a review. Just go on your device, search for the Nourished Child Podcast in your podcast app, and hit subscribe. That's it. This small act helps others find my podcast while alerting you every time a new episode is released. Last but not least, if you're feeling the urge to get on top of your child's nutrition, my parent program, The Nourished Child Project Live, which begins in May, is perfect for you. Want to learn more about it? Send me an email or check the show notes at jillcastle.com forward slash 057, where I will include a link with more information. And P.S. Take a minute to check out my new website. I'd love to hear what you think. You can post your comment on The Nourished Child Facebook page. As always, Thanks for joining me today. I'm so glad you tuned in. Please be sure to give the child in your life, picky or not, sweet lover or sweet shunner, and big or small, a loving squeeze today. Bye for now. 
Thanks for listening to the Nourish Child Podcast, where the number one goal is to help you grow a nourished child inside and out.